they always call the captain the old man because captains are always old men. <laughs> I've, when I was a captain at, in my 30s, my 60-year-old chief engineer called me the old man. The sad fact is America has lost the ability to man large ocean-going commercial vessels. We have no more American-flagged fleet. I, I forget what the number is. There's like 12 American flag cargo ships left in the world. There was only one cell phone in the entire town that worked. And there was only one place that it worked. It was up on a soccer pitch on the top of a hill. So that's what that's the time I hired a witch doctor to go and put a, a curse on that soccer field. <laughs> so the court director who had the cell phone wouldn't go up there and, and call Port-au-Prince to report it. And in fact, my client, the mortgagee, Love to show his friends a line item in his bill, one hundred dollars for the services of one witch doctor. I like the fact that uh, that the bad guys get their comeuppance. It uh, gives me a great deal of satisfaction. You repossess and or re-steal ships for a living. What, what is the correct term really just repossess or am I close enough with re-steal? Because some it certainly sounds like that. Well, I don't like to use the word steal. Of course. Uh, in fact, we always work uh, under the color of law. Um, but the fact of the matter is that uh, we are either repossessors on the behalf of a mortgagee or we are reclaimers, uh, if the term would fit, uh, on behalf of some other party, and normally it would be the owner. Uh, mm -hmm. So I guess it would, be a, it would be a repossession because the owner was in possession before his ship was seized. So we're repossessing the ship for the owner. So in, in essence, we're repo men. Yeah, th this makes a lot of sense, although I think a lot of folks are shocked that there are boat repo men, and they think that if there are, they're probably repoing fishing boats, not cargo ships and, and tankers. Am I? Is it cargo ships and tankers primarily that you go for, you and your crew? Yes, that's our specialty. We work with a company called National Liquidators who operate in the United States, and they do repossess fishing boats and pleasure craft and so on. We do not operate in the United States. Mm -hmm. So when they have a job outside the States, they come to us. When we have a job in the States, we go to them. Um, our, our specialty is reclaiming ships that have been illegitimately seized, either by a private party or more often by a government. And you say you don't work in the United States, I assume, because if you take my boat from me, I sue you and the law, which is functioning in this country for the most part, helps me get that ship back. Precisely. In fact, we don't operate in any country that has a functioning series of laws and a, and a procedure in place for a legitimate owner to make a claim against a an illegitimate seizure. Right. Interesting. Because, of course, countries that have no good rule of law often sort of pretend they do. I mean, there's there's no place with clearer law than maybe North Korea, right, where everything is against the law. Um, but there's no actual rule of law, right? It's all just sort of a, a function of the dictator of the state. It's got to be, I, I suppose you have kind of a list of places where, okay, this is what we consider to be a place with rule of law, and these are the places we work that we consider to, to not have any legitimate rule of law. How do you make that determination? Oh, I don't go in there with any preconceived notion. Uh, mm -hmm. Even Venezuela has laws. Uh, they're they're not followed, but they but they exist. Haiti has laws, uh, and unfortunately, there the Haitian lawyers have no concept of what the law is because there are no law books. But the fact of the matter is, the laws do exist somewhere. Um, what I do when we are assigned a case is I will look into the situation, and, and in fact, I have to go to, get on the ground, so that if there is a possibility of taking the ship out legally, that's what I prefer to do. And I quite often, I'll work with the correspondent, that's the uh, insurance person, uh, the lawyer in the local jurisdiction. I'll work with the port authorities. Um, I, I, will, I would do almost anything to get the ship out, including some things that I probably couldn't do here in the States. <laughs> will do almost anything to get the ship out without having to do a middle of the night extraction. That's a last resort. Of course, I, I would imagine calling you generally is the last resort. 
uh, for any company that decides they, they need to give you a call, it's probably a pretty bad day in the office for them. Nobody ever calls to say, look, everything's going great with my ship. <laughs> So who steals the ship in the first place? Because a common misconception is that pirates are only the guys in some off the coast of Somalia who come up in a dhow with an RPG and say, we're getting on the boat and we're going to drive it back to wherever and hold it for ransom. Your, your pirates wear designer suits, probably. Well, I, I dealt with Somali pirates as well, but uh, the they are not actually nearly as much a threat as are the quasi-legitimate pirates who operate under color under what they would like to call the color of law. Venezuela, Haiti, Dominican Republic. In fact, there are some other countries where this operates um, as well that we would think are law-abiding countries. Greece, for example. It's, uh, Greece is a very bad place to get your ship seized, and uh, Greek law is very pliable. Uh, when it comes to seizing ships. The Greeks have been doing this for 4,000 years, and they know exactly how to do it. Yeah, I've heard that a, a lot of the Greek the Greek shipping industry is essentially, I, I could be talking out of school here, kind of above the law, right? It's just, it's all of these same guys from the same small island villages. They all run the major shipping in and out of Greece, and they have a lot of political capital. And I think there's a lot of exemptions and a lot of tax exemptions and a lot of, what they say goes kind of stuff. And so despite it, despite Greece being in the EU, it's kind of with shipping, it's just, it's, it's almost a free for all in some ways, or at least you have to follow what the, the magnates at the top decide you're going to do. Well, it's not just the Greeks though. The, the, once you get beyond the 12 mile limit, uh, you're in the open ocean and uh, you're beyond the reach of any warship other than your own nation's uh, warships. So when you consider that the greatest number of ships in the world are flagged by Liberia, Liberia has no navy. <laughs> Liberia cannot inspect a single ship beyond their 12-mile limit. They may have some little, little patrol boats. But the fact of the matter is that if a Liberian flagged ship does something wrong on the open ocean, no one has the authority to intercept it except the warships of Liberia. Of course, what happens is uh, another warship, let's say a U.S. warship, will follow the vessel. They'll get the Liberian ambassador to give them permission, which Liberia does freely. And then, but but the point is that Panama and Liberia have very little uh, interest in controlling their tonnage. They're only interested in getting the money for the tonnage. And after you've paid your dues and gotten your flag and gotten your certificates, you can pretty much do what you want. Yeah, we did a, an episode on flags of convenience, episode 739, where we talk about why Liberia, which has no no navy, and Panama ha have most of the flags, most of the world's ships are flagged there. It's taxes, convenience, compliance, all kinds of reasons. Uh, so these ships you end up repossessing, they're, they go into a port to what, deliver cargo, and then they just can't leave? Is that how it works? It's It sort of sounds like... They roll in thinking everything's huggy dory, and then they, they they can't leave. Yeah, there are various reasons. Uh, uh, it, there are various scenarios. One common scenario is a shore side pirate who has uh, fraudulently made a claim against the ship and uh, has gotten a judge. And in fact, in Haiti, you can, a justice of the peace in in a little hut uh, on the beach can actually seize a ten million dollar ship. So uh, you just have to go to a, a local authority, uh, pay a little money, either some on top and some below the table, and then you get uh, paperwork that, what's this called, papering the ship. When you go on board and you tap a, a notice on the uh, wheelhouse window, and papering the ship is the act of seizing the ship. Now the owner, if 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 it's an if it's that kind of situation, the owner. Uh, can he can try to fight it legally, but uh, very often he will find that there is no fighting it in the local courts, and that's when he comes to us. Okay, so these are corrupt port officials who are essentially in the business w alongside a judge or whatever of saying, oh, this boat uh, hit the dock and it caused damage and we're going to keep it because 
because of our laws that allow us to do that. And then somebody says, wait a minute, that's my $15 million ship. What do you mean you're keeping it? Uh, I, I want it back. And they say, well, tough kishka, as my grandma would say, you're out of luck. And then that's when they call you. Essentially. Um, there, are, there are other scenarios as well, but that's a common one. So you don't, as many people made this, when I was prepping, a lot of people were saying, I oh, steal the ship. You don't steal the ship. You simply bring the ship to a place that respects international law. That's it. That's correct. Yeah, that sounds like a very useful service. And I, I know you're also an attorney and so is, is your business partner. That m makes a lot of sense because I would imagine you have to do some diligence to make sure you're not just being set up by somebody who wants you to steal a ship for them in contradiction of international law. Yeah, that has happened. Um, that's why we have to do, we our, our billing is always two stage. The first stage is our investigation, and which normally involves me going on the ground and finding out what is happening and why the ship has been seized. Uh, a number of times uh, we have been approached by owners, some, perhaps sometimes Greek owners, who uh, think that we can help them avoid paying a legitimate debt. Um, once we find that out, then that's the end of the job. If we decide that our client has a righteous claim to his own vessel or a mortgagee to the vessel, then we will make a, a second tier, a second tranche in which we uh, receive a second payment and estimated expenses. And that's when we begin the actual operation. That makes sense, right. So you wanna make sure you get paid, because if you find out it's an, it's not a legitimate job and you spent 40 hours flying somewhere to look at a dock that was supposedly hit and it was hit and they do owe the money, they're not gonna pay you if you didn't if you then suddenly ask for the money saying, hey, I'm not gonna help you. By the way, that'll be $14,000, right? So it makes sense, get some of that money up front. It, it makes sense that they're trying to hood, some folks anyway are trying to hoodwink you into taking a ship that th that wasn't held by a valid claim. Uh, some of these claims are probably quite expensive, right? I mean, you're looking at what damaged cargo, damage to the dock. What other reasons can somebody legitimately steal or seize a ship? Oh, well, there are Chandler debts, there are fuel debts. Um, uh, a ship normally will... Uh, uh, encumber itself in almost every port it goes with repair costs. Um, and of course, there is the pilotage, and there's tug costs. Um, there are in, there are various charges that the ship will have to pay before it leaves. So uh, normally those, th those are not the problems. Those costs are normally dealable, even if you're a pirate, you will pay that rather than have to deal with losing your ship. Mm -hmm. Our, our situation is normally a very expensive cargo damage or uh, a, a dock damage, or in the case of, for example, um, uh, one of our more famous uh, operations was the motor vessel Patrick M out of Venezuela, in which the, uh, the scam was a, a family, a Peruvian crime family, uh, chartered our vessel with the express purpose of seizing it. They sent it to a port that Puerto Cabello, where they already had the situation in hand and they had a Venezuelan uh, subsidiary ready to paper the ship as soon as we arrived. What they did was they refused to pay the freight to carry the cargo from Peru to Venezuela. Every ship has the right to refuse to open its hatches if its freight has not been paid. That's international law. Mm -hmm. The captain refused to open the hatch. The Venezuelan subsidiary then went to the court and said, we have been harmed by the delay in opening the hatch, and we therefore want this ship. And of course, their harm in the 24-hour delay would have been very minor, but uh, the ship was seized, and the ship was going to remain seized for months and months. And the owner of the ship, who, he named the ship after his father, Patrick M. Uh, Jim Maher was the owner. He came to Venezuela, and he was distraught. The captain of the ship was so nervous and so uh, beside himself that the captain refused to take it out. And although I was only port captain, uh, I decided I wasn't going to let that happen either. So I went, I sneaked on board and uh, got the crew. And the crew was cooperative. They didn't want to stay there either. So we uh, we got the engine started and got out.
Yeah, I want to get into some of the details of how that stuff happens. So these ships get stolen because they get seized for a reason, in your case, that's not legitimate, right? Some corrupt port decides, hey, we're going to steal this boat by refusing to pay for the cargo hatch, the cargo delivery. And then do they, is the plan to use the boat? Is the plan to just sell the boat to somebody else and say, hey, we seized a $15 million boat. Here it is for $10 million, $1 million in bribery across whoever needs to get bribed. And it's a pretty decent business. I mean, the margins could be pretty big on stealing something as expensive as a, sh as a ship. Well, yeah, so, some of these guys would run it themselves if they are experienced ship owners. But no normally, especially if the port is the one involved, their their interest is in selling the ship. There's a ready market for ships. And and don't forget, once a ship goes through a judicial auction, all prior claims are wiped clean. Even wow. even fraudulent actions have no bearing once the gavel comes down. That's why uh, with that vessel, the Maya Express, the the auction was going to be on Thursday. And uh, we ha and we didn't get the ship out until Tuesday, but we knew we had to do it. Even though Tuesday was a full moon, it was a terrible night for me because you know, cannot imagine how bright it was, a full moon on a cloudless night in Haiti. But the thing about it was we couldn't wait. Once the gavel came down on Thursday, our client was completely out of luck. And the guy who planned to steal the ship would have the ship free and clear. Wow. So So they don't even have to vanish the boat by changing the name and turning off the transponder and moving it around and hiding it. They can just say, oh, well, we legally auctioned this off. And yeah, this thing was stolen from somebody. Maybe we don't know. It doesn't matter. It's been auctioned. And now this person has good, free and clear titles. So tough Kishka again. Sorry, I got to stop using that. <laughs> but like the ship is then free to use. That's a really good racket for a criminal. I've taken zero maritime law classes in law school, so I know absolutely nothing about this, but it makes sense they would have to have that free and clear because if if this is 500 years ago or whatever when they wrote this law, you don't know that some ship that's from Greece that's now in Antwerp has an action against it in Portugal. You just bought the ship from a guy, so you have to have, they have to draw the lines somewhere in an era with near with pre pretty much zero communication and that was the most expeditious way to do it back then and they haven't they haven't really decided to revamp this for for reasons uh, that that perhaps make sense when you dig a little bit but wow so they can just they really can just grab your stuff and auction it off and you can't do anything about it that is just bananas so you really are under pressure yeah i was that night Okay, so I know, I do know that if you, in normal law, you file a lawsuit against an individual or an entity, if you crash into my front gate, I sue you, you uh, pay me or the insurance company does. But in maritime law, correct me where I'm wrong here, your claim is against the ship itself, correct? Yes, that's correct. It's a unique feature of maritime law. It's an in rim claim as opposed to an in personam claim. Mm -hmm. And the ship itself is the defendant. So the uh, pleading will read um, um, Allied Stevedores versus the MV Sevilla. And if no one defends the ship, then the ship uh, obviously can't defend itself and it gives up. Right. Okay. So this is just. For, for the legal nerds like me, maybe just super inter, super early versions of international law. You can't sue somebody from Greece if you're in England in 1702 or whatever. It's hard to do it even now. So you just seize the ship to settle the debt. And the bandits that you are repossessing these boats from, they, they abuse that system deliberately because that's their business model. That's correct. They have found a, they have found a way to legitimize a an immoral action and unfortunately the the realities of international shipping are such that it's not easy to change this regiment so um it's still that case today where is most of this type of work where do you find yourself you said haiti earlier uh, where else uh, venezuela trinidad dominican republic uh, mexico um, i did one job out of mexico um, um, Africa, um, Greece, um, that's about it. Okay. I, 
Are there any places you won't or can't work? I mean, you mentioned places with functional rule of law. That's not really what I'm getting at. I mean, what about like Iran or China? Well, after having spent some months in Somalia, I'm not, I'm not so worried about these other countries. In fact, uh, they might be a little bit more conducive to pleasant living. So, no, I, I don't have any preconceived rejections. I probably would not go to North Korea, but who knows? I, I we, my my business partner and I will listen to all uh, to all approaches. Yeah, North Korea might be a tough one, uh, just because of the logistics involved. And and yeah, we, we've all seen what happens there. What about Cuba? Cuba is an interesting case, right? Because it's so close to the United States, and yet it, it, it that could be a complicated working environment. Yes, I think if we did anything in Cuba, it would be we would be working with the State Department. Uh, we would not be doing anything in Cuba on our own individually. Uh, we we've worked with the U.S. government before um, in some politically sensitive matters, and one was involving a tanker uh, off the Venezuelan coast. So um, we will we will investigate, and we will we will uh, charge for our investigation, and then we'll see after that whether we go on with the project. But obviously, North Korea, Cuba, uh, there are probably Yemen, there are probably some other places where we would have to charge a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. That, I you gotta. I suppose the pricing is dependent upon the value of the vessel and also just how likely things are to go belly up. Exactly, exactly. That we factor. That, we quite honestly factor that in. Uh, you know, the risk involved is is part of our calculus as to what it's going to take, because the, there is a point at which we will turn the vessel the, the job down. And we have turned job down as as being unworkable. In fact, there was a Venezuelan job, which would have been quite remunerative, but uh, the chance of the crew getting killed by a Venezuelan helicopter, because the Venezuelans don't respect the twelve mile limit. So even though we had a plan to get the vessel out beyond the twelve mile limit before dawn, uh, being towed would mean that at a four or five knot speed. Within an hour or so, a Venezuelan helicopter could catch up with us in international water, and I could not guarantee to the crew that the Venezuelan helicopter would not just shoot them out of the water. Oh, my so, gosh. So you, the 12-mile limit is, that's the international, that's the line at which a coast becomes international waters, 12 miles off the coast. So you're, you're at that point, it sounds like you were worried that the military or Coast Guard, whatever, of, of Venezuela would just come and sink the actual ship because it was being taken out and, and and that being in international water they just don't care about that yeah that that was my fear wow wow that yeah well you did the right thing i mean people's lives are always going to be more valuable than a tanker even if it is a, a full of oil and worth a lot of money at least that's where i fall on it it sounds like you're you think similarly i do yeah is is it always corrupt ports that where you go after ships i'm wondering what you know what happens if i buy a 10 million dollar yacht and, uh, in my dreams, I put the payment down, the down payment, and then I, I take it to my friend's uncle's port over in Granada or whatever, or or whatever, look to the Caribbean, Dominican Republic, and I say, this is my boat now, right? I'm I'm the captain now, and just never pay the rest of the mortgage or the loan on the boat. Am I going to get a visit from Max Hardberger and Associates, or are you going to say, look, here's a couple people that go after yachts, I'm I'm after cargo and tankers only? No, no, no. We uh, the our restriction is on uh, acting outside of the United States and outside of countries with the rule of law. Mm -hmm. uh, we have we we repossessed aircraft. We've repossessed uh, uh, ferries. We've repossessed uh, uh, the vessels are not that small because we're so expensive that it, it, the vessel has to bear the cost. Mm -hmm. We we've gone beyond. We uh, we've taken in. We've been approached on various other. Uh, uh, projects like, for example, a submarine in Russia and so on. But um, <laughs> that's very specialized. I don't know if did you turn that one down? That seems like it would be a little bit scary unless you really you gotta really know what you're doing. Well, at some point, it was an interesting story, but we didn't get the submarine. How do you even find? Well, I guess it's in it's in port, right? So it's not underwater. A submarine is it is it substantially similar to a 
tanker or cargo ship in terms if there it seems like there's some quite specialized navigation and controls on something like a submarine that can go because you're not talking about a small submarine that you're riding around looking at fish right this is a giant military grade vessel i assume well this was a whiskey class uh, russian sub based on a, a world war ii german design um there were a dozen of them in kaliningrad and uh, one of them was operational and used for training, as a matter of fact. Submarines are very seaworthy. You know, it, a submarine can crawl, can go around the world uh, because it has so little exposed uh, wind resistance. And so much of the hull is in the water that actually submarines on the surface, not below, but on the surface, they're quite seaworthy. Wow. It's... That would that would just be terrifying to be at if, if it, okay well let me back up this is a Russian submarine in a Russian enclave Kaliningrad in Eastern Europe or, or in the Baltics essentially who wants us who wants that that isn't the Russian government who has any claim to that that isn't the Russian government well that was a little bit different <clears throat> without going into too much of the politics mm -hmm. at the time Peru and Ecuador were at war. Peru had just bought a German diesel submarine, and Ecuador felt that it had to have a submarine also, but it couldn't afford a new German diesel submarine. So that was the that was the background. Ah, okay. Well, interesting. Yeah, that's a that's a story for another day, I suppose. I, I'd love to back up a little bit and ask how you got into this because it seems obviously you have a background in seafaring. But who decides one day to call you and say, hey, I've got a very unique problem. Can you handle it? And then what what sort of possesses you to say, I can do that. I can I can take that ship back for you. Well, no, it wasn't a conscious decision. Um, after I took the the, the uh, Patrick M out of Venezuela, there was an article written about it in a shipping magazine. And, uh, you know, people. Uh, began to find, and it's a small community, especially down in Miami where I was living at the time. So I, my buddies and I would get together around the Miami River and laugh about this thing and so on. But it wasn't long after that that a fellow called me and he had gotten his ship seized in Trinidad. And uh, so I took that one out. And then after that, I guess people began to, and, and then of course, some years later when Michael Bono was thinking about doing the same thing uh, from a lawyer standpoint, uh, he couldn't find anybody else who would actually go in to do it. And uh, when we got together, it worked out. So, th yeah, this is this is such a very unique line of work. I would how many other people in the world do this kind of thing? Are you you've got to be one of a small group? Well, there's a couple of there's a company in uh, England that does it. Uh, I don't think they're very active now, but they and traditionally they were quite active when we started. They were our major competitors. Um, I had a very good friend uh, named John Lightbone, who's now passed, who uh, had also on his own, like me, would do would do this for, for clients. Um, he, he was an amazing fellow, both a chief engineer and a, and a captain. There are very few people in the world who are both unlimited chief engineers and unlimited masters. But uh, other than that, no, I, I don't really know of too many people. This sounds like a combination between intelligence and extraction work, because you don't just run into the port and grab the boat, right? You mentioned you go down and, and investigate the claim first, but that can't be all you do, right? I, I assume you're also looking at, okay, if, is the claim valid? If so, how am I gonna get this thing out of here? How, is there fuel in the boat? And how are you doing this? Do you act like a tourist or, or do you say, look, I'm here from the owner and I want to take a look around the ship and they, and they let you do that? Well, my modus operandi generally involves getting on the ground at the port where the ship is and going to the bars uh, that are closest to the ship where the ship's crew are going to be hanging out and maybe suborning the ladies a little bit. And <laughs> Um, what what does suborning the ladies mean? I, I need to get a translation on that one. Well, the background is that the Caribbean is full of old white men, old ship captains from from Europe mostly, but some Americans, who have retired to the to the ports where they spent their life, and they pick up a young a local lady as a girlfriend or wife, and that's so such a common 
phenomenon in these South American ports that for me, for me to go and hire a girl to hang out with me, she's happy because she doesn't have to do what she normally has to do. I'm happy because it, everybody around sees an old white ship captain with a young local and he's curious. He wants to know how is your ship? What's mm -hmm. going on? I, 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 I hear your ship is uh, almost out of food. What's wrong? Why can't you guys leave, et cetera, et cetera? Is there anything I can do to help? So you can actually sometimes get the girls on board because these some captains will allow the girls on board. And those girls, of course, they traffic in information about, about ships with each other. And I can uh, get them to tell me what they find out on board. I can also go on board under pretense um, as an inspector. Uh, I've done that, uh, go on board as a port state control inspector with some fake uh, legitimate looking uh, IDs. <laughs> um, also, I can pretend to be a buyer. Almost all of these ships are for sale at some level, even the ones that are not being advertised for sale. And the crew does, the crew may not know, for example, that the owner has not arranged for a buyer to come on board. So I may come on board and say, I'm here to represent uh, Trident Shipping, and they want me to take a look at the ship before we buy it. But we're willing to pay all the crew their back pay their back wages as soon as we pay. Boy, talk about get the crew's attention then. <laughs> when they're four or five months behind and their children are dying of starvation back home. And so a guy comes on board and says, I want to look at the ship and we'll pay all back wages as soon as we buy it. <clears throat> you will not believe how much cooperation you can get. Right. Oh my gosh. I didn't even think about that. They're really that many months behind on pay sometimes. That's terrible. Oh, that's very normal. When a ship owner decides to stop paying his debts, he stops paying the crew first. He knows the crew can't leave. Once a crewman leaves the ship, he will never get paid. He has to stay on board until somebody will assume the, the crew debt and pay the crew. Ugh, that's terrible. That's and just such the, a and awful... if the crew get, And if the crew gets put off in a foreign port, there is a good chance they will never go home. They'll die in that foreign port. I have seen that happen. Really? Because they just have no money and no way of getting back from whatever, Venezuela to the Philippines or wherever they're from? Exactly. These countries have no fund like the United States does to bring people home. If their family cannot come up with the airfare, uh, there was one fellow, a very nice fellow from Peru, who died in Port-au-Prince because he got sick. His family had no money for a doctor, no money to send him home. He had been put off the ship. The, the Romano was the name of the ship. And he had been put off the ship when the ship was seized, along with the rest of the crew. Half of them got home. He died. Some of the others, I don't know what happened to them. But that's oh a very common problem. That's terrible. That's really awful to hear that kind of thing happening. It's so unfair and and just so tragic. So you go in and out of the country by land, or do you go out with the ship when you take the ship out? I, I'm, I'm a little confused. So if you, is it your crew that takes the ship, or do you go in and out some other way? Well, I usually go in by airfare. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, that makes sense. So... Whether I go out with the ship or not depends on the situation. Quite often, I do have to go with the ship, if, especially if we have a dicey situation and we're going, doing it in the middle of the night. If the ship is being towed out, uh, then I don't necessarily have to go with the ship. Like the uh, Maya Express, we had a, a tugboat come in and tow it out. So I recon the situation and I monitor the situation from another vessel. But once the vessel was outside of the port, uh, my job was pretty much over and it was beyond my control. So I, I, I did him out for the uh, Port-au-Prince airport as fast as I could after the ship got out of port. Maya Express is the ship that was in Haiti? Correct. Do you worry that if you cross, if, if you're flying in, are you worried at all that you're on a list that says, hey, the guy who stole the last the ship last time has just landed at the airport? maybe put some extra guards over there or give people a little bit of a heads up over at the port because this guy's not here on a guided tour. Well, the real problem is going into the computer. That's what I don't mm. like. You know, it's, it's, you'll get caught when, when you try to go in and they see your name on the computer and then they take you into the back room. Um, so there have been times, well, one time, for example, I went into Venezuela by ferry from Trinidad because I was afraid to fly in. And I knew that that little port in Venezuela, <clears throat> that they didn't they didn't check people very carefully that were coming from Trinidad, you know, across the uh, bay there. 
because I was afraid that I was in the Venezuelan computer for a preview for that Patrick M extraction. What kind of people work on your crew? It seems like I'm assuming you get resumes thrown at you all the time, but what kind of people do you actually hire? Well, they're seamen. They're, they're licensed crewmen. Uh, the most important, of course, is the chief engineer. Um, but they all must be licensed crewmen. Thanks for watching on YouTube. Remember, you can also enjoy The Jordan Harbinger Show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Our podcast feed is a treasure trove of insights from intellectuals, authors, spies, artists, athletes, pioneers, engineers, former mafia bosses, and business leaders, all sharing their secrets to success. For more information, click the link in the description. Now, back to the show. I'm guessing that a lot of military types try to apply, but what you really need is somebody who can work on any ship, even if something is sort of broken, maybe the lights don't work. Problem solvers in the uh, in the seafaring ex of sea with seafaring expertise as opposed to to somebody who's just brave or or shoots straight because you don't use violence, right? You use cunning and guile. That's correct. And and we have no use for for um, uh, well, I'm not excluding that. And in fact, in in my Somali work, we we did have military types uh, involved, but uh, generally, as a general rule, I need people who are extremely competent in their field, especially the chief engineer. He's the most important man in the entire team, including me. You know, he, nobody can replace a good chief engineer. What does that person do? I, I mean, it sounds like they're the probably in charge of making sure the boat actually works, which, yeah, that would be important when you're sneaking a boat out of a port. Oh, it's it's not easy at all. It's nothing like starting a car. And there are many, many things. In fact, quite often I will take the chief engineer with me on my recon on, on board because he needs to see what's going on in the engine room. He needs to see if there's some part that's missing that we're going to have to have. When we come on board in the middle of the night, a chief engineer who can board a vessel that he doesn't know in the middle of the night, explore the engine room by flashlight, get the air valves open because these engines start with air, get the compressors running to get the air pressure up, get the oil going to the heads, get the oil going to the, to the valves, and then to start the engine and uh, and be sure enough that the engine is going to keep running, that we can then take axes and chop the lines because we don't we don't pull the lines in; we chop them with axes. Once we chop the lines with axes, I need that I need that engine to run and run and keep running until we get 13 miles offshore. Wow, I've heard that you don't use very many Americans on your crew. What's the What's the reason for that? Are you trying to hire locals who speak the local language or know their way around? No, the sad fact is America has lost the ability to man large ocean-going commercial vessels. We have no more American-flagged fleet. I, I forget what the number is. There's like 12 American-flagged cargo ships left in the world. Um, so there are no Americans. This is a serious problem, not just in my business, also in the marine surveying business, where you need chief engineers and captains as marine surveyors in New Orleans, where uh, the ships are very large, the grain ships are very large. These marine surveying firms in New Orleans are having a terrible time hiring Americans. They have to hire Indians, Pakistanis. They have to hire crewmen who are experienced and good, good quality men, but they have to come from foreign because we do not have a reserve of American mariners from which to draw. Even with all the... This is probably a stupid question, but we have so many people who are retiring from the Navy, but I guess most of them are not actually running the ship itself, right? So is that is that pool that, that pool's not enough to draw from? Well, there are a lot of mariners on uh, supply boats and tugboats and so on, but a, a commercial freighter of 50,000 tons uh, that, whose engine runs at 100 RPM is a completely different animal. And uh, you cannot go from one to the other. You have to start as an oiler or a cadet on a large ship and work your way up year after year in that large ship environment. It is not the kind of uh, machinery where you can go from one to the other. And that's the problem for me would be, not only does the man have to be a good chief engineer, but he, and he has to be brave too, to willing to take the risk, 
but um, he has to be the kind of chief engineer who can go on board a ship that he doesn't know and work in the dark and uh, and get it going. Yeah, that that is kind of a heavy lift. How many guys do you need to to take a ship? I assume it varies with the size of the vessel. Yes, for, uh, if a vessel has a normal crew, let's say a 30,000 tonner will have a normal crew of say 15 to 17. Mm -hmm. I need about six to eight men to get her to a near port. If we're going to go a long way, I need a full crew. But generally I'm going to go to the nearest safe port. So in say three or four days away. And for that, I need a skeleton crew of at least six or eight guys. Wow, okay. And you, I assume these guys don't charge their normal day rate when they work for you. You, you probably sweeten it up a little bit given, given the risk factor involved. Yeah, oh yeah, they get paid very well. Um, you know, uh, uh, for a cadet who makes, uh, generally makes $100, well, we wouldn't take a cadet, but let's say for a, a an engineer who would normally make 250 to $300 a day, uh, we'll pay 1000 mm. Yeah, it's, is this a young man's game? Because it sounds like, I, I look, I'm 43, I've got two little kids. I, I'm not, granted, I, I'm useless to you. In fact, I'm useless in many ways. But I, this is not the kind of thing I would ever... <laughs> want to sign up for maybe like 20 years ago 10 years ago this would have been right up my alley regardless of skill set but i'm curious what kind of guys go for this well the chief engineer is not going to be a young man no uh, he's going to need many years of experience and I, I i would be suspicious of a chief engineer in his 20s uh, <laughs> how old are they usually 30s 40s 50s 50s, 50s. oh wow okay wow good chief should be in his 50s um, 40s maybe, but and of course that's why they go. They always call the captain the old man because captains are always old men. I've, when I was a captain at, in my 30s, my 60 year old chief engineer called me the old man. <laughs> the, uh, but the but the other crew have to be young and strong. I mean, you you know, for example, your deck crew, you want men who can handle those lines and can, and if we have to, you want men who can keep up and run away if you have to run. Yeah. So I don't, I, I have not hired men that were not physically uh, able to handle themselves. How do you know that a boat is, or that a ship is safe to use and has fuel? That's part of your recon, right? That you look at the gauges and make sure, do they usually just leave the, the vessel fueled up in port? Well, yeah, um, unless unless some crook has sold fuel off the vessel. When we've yeah, had... I was worried about that. Yeah, like what if they drain it and sell that, and then you're sitting there stuck. But normally you don't. Normally, uh, the, and especially there's no market for heavy bunker. Uh, so if the vessel uses heavy bunker, then that's all going to be all board. Uh, the diesel, there's a market for diesel, and every ship has to use some diesel. You start your engines with diesel, then you switch over to heavy bunker. Um but there are no gauges. You have to actually sound the tanks with a with a sounding tape. And but then again, if you're pretending to be a buyer, it's quite normal that you'll sound the tanks. Uh, if you're an inspector, uh, you might come up with a reason that, for example, the ship has been accused of pollution, and therefore you want to see how what's in the tanks, et cetera, et cetera. Generally, the crew itself is not very hostile or suspicious. Uh, with the crew and with the girls on shore and with everybody. If you show up and you ha they have no reason to suspect that you're not what you appear to be or what you claim to be, as a general rule, they don't. They're so busy. Everybody's so busy trying to make a living, they don't look further than that. You know, you you're an old drunk white man with his young Venezuelan girlfriend. Uh, you're interested in this ship, and uh, uh, you you want to help out somehow. Uh, of course, you uh, there's nothing uh, unusual about that. How do you get food while you're on the ship, or is are, is it just short enough where you you don't really need to worry about that these these missions or these operations? Well, there's always going to be some food on board. Yeah, as far as I'm I'm I don't even worry about that. If uh, if we take a ship out and there's no food on board, we'll eat the lifeboat crackers. <laughs> yeah, that that makes sense. I guess you could bring a couple power bars in your backpack. I mean, you're not on the ship for a long period of time, right? It's a couple of days at most. Oh, I don't know. This one in Greece, I went on board for a few days and ended up on a, on the boat for, I think, six weeks or five weeks. What? Why? Why? 
Well, it was, I was trapped. Uh, the, the, the captain uh, refused to, the captain had originally agreed to do what we wanted, but then he got cold feet, dropped anchor uh, behind an island in Greece, and uh, an uninhabited island, just a huge rock, and refused to move. And um, and there was a, a stalemate between the, my, my client was the mortgagee. There was a stalemate between the mortgagee and the owner, and it took them five weeks to uh, to get it resolved. And it, it was never actually resolved. The captain finally got desperate and agreed to to take the ship to Malta, where we had where we seized the ship in Malta. Wow. Wow. That's that's a lot of crackers <laughs> for six weeks, man. That's a lot of crackers. No, we had oh. plenty of food. No, we had plenty of food on board. It was I, I know. All, all Filipino yeah. crew. So yeah. on a Filipino crew ship, you have a rice uh, bowl that uh, a rice cooker that stays full all the time. So, <laughs> and we never went we never went short of food on that job. Now there have been jobs where we you know where we we did have to try to search around and and try to find some food on board, and some of the cans were kind of old, but uh, not on that job. I, I mentioned earlier that you never use force. Always guile and cunning. Are we talking about bribery? You know, are, the guards are are around the boat. Uh, or sorry, the guards are around the port. I assume, but are they also on the ship itself? Oh, well, I've had several cases where the guards were on the ship. One in one case, I had to bribe the guard, you know, to to get off. I had to give him enough money where he could go join his family in the interior of the country and never have to worry about a guard job again, uh, because you know, after all, he's going to be in trouble. Uh, in the ship in the morning, yeah. ship is gone. They're going to be looking for him. Of course, luckily in place like that was Venezuela, where you can disappear quite easily. Uh, there was another case where the guard was on board, and I actually had to hire a girl to give him a, some sleeping powder to knock him out. And I, I delivered his carps onto the not his carps, his body onto the uh, onto the dock, made sure he was still breathing steadily, and then we took the ship out. Oh my gosh. If the host country catches you I, I, doing this, I mean, not even gets you personally, but if they see the boat rolling out, they send the Coast Guard or warships out to get you? Or is it just kind of like, ah, that thing's moving, we don't want to go chase it? How, how how hard do they pursue you? You mentioned the Venezuela job where you weren't sure if they were going to follow you with a helicopter. That's pretty aggressive. But is, is this often a business dispute where once you're moving that thing, they they're over it? No. I don't no. think they've ever had that happen. Okay. They very aggressively pursue it. They they see, not only do they see potential money leaving, but also there's sometimes quite a bit of investment that each party has, has made into the scam. And they see their investment uh, disappearing. For example, on the Maya Express, uh, the, the pirate who had it seized, my understanding was that he had over $100,000 invested into bribes and uh, various expenses involved in holding the ship for those months. Wow. Okay. So, yeah, this is the, the golden goose is taking flight at that point. They're not going to let it go. Yikes. You mentioned that a full moon was a terrible night to take the boat. I assume th that's a visibility thing. Is that what you're hinting at there? Right. Exactly. So do you pick deliberately bad conditions? Is it kind of like the worse the weather, the better for this kind Absolutely. of job? Absolutely. The only way that time that I had that uh, guard uh, carried off the ship, the only way we could take off in the middle of the afternoon was because I, I knew that there was a huge th thunderstorm coming. You could see it coming out of the Southeast. And I timed everything for just before the thunderstorm hit. And the moment the thunderstorm hit was when we left. Well, they tried to chase us. In fact, they sent a, a warship from Dominican, from from Santo Domingo, which is about 25 miles away, to chase us. But I knew that I had already reconned that warship, and I knew they had old, very old radars, like World War II open array radars, the kind that looked like like fishing nets. If you remember those old white radars, and I knew that that radar would see nothing in a, in a rainstorm because of rain clutter, and that's apparently what happened because they didn't they didn't catch us. Wow, it seems like the best time to do this if you don't have a storm would be some sort of like national holiday or I don't know how how would it how's a Saturday night when everybody's kind of like maybe drinking on the job or not showing up to work or hungover from the night before. It seems like you're really timing this quite precisely. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That uh, national holidays are good. Uh, 
feast days are good. Uh, one time in Greece, I managed to get a ship out on uh, on Good Friday because I knew that the Coast Guard would be, all, all the Coast Guard officers would be drunk. Well, I knew they'd be drunk because I paid the agent to take them a case of whiskey and at the Coast Guard, at the lookout office where they where they could see the ship's path. And it was on a Friday night of Greek Easter. And so they nobody noticed when the ship slipped out. Um, another time that that ship in Mexico, um, I knew there was a disco right next to the port. And it's a very quiet place. And I knew that the starting the ship engine would alert the guards. There was no guard on board, but the guards were like not more than, say, 150 feet away. But what I did was I paid the disco to put uh, their speakers out on the lawn. And well, I didn't do it. I had a guy do it. And he was going to have a big party out. And, and so at the moment they had the speakers turned up full blast, we started the engine and sneaked out. <laughs> so the speakers were to drown out the sounds of the engine. So any guards would have just not heard. I had already lost their hearing due to the mariachi music. That's real. That's a good idea. I got to hand it to you. It's a pretty good idea. How do you get on the ship itself? If you go through the the port, yeah, you can walk up the gangway, but that's kind of like knocking on the front door. Do you ever board the ship from, I mean, like other pirates do, from the side or the rear? Or, 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 I, I, obviously, you can tell I know jack squat about ships. Yeah, I, I, I've boarded ships from the seaside uh, where you can't be seen, but there has to be a, a pilot ladder. You have to have cooperation with somebody on board to do that. Mm -hmm. I've never actually climbed up the, the anchor chain. <laughs> People have done it. I know thieves who have done it, but I myself have not ever climbed up an anchor chain. Um, if I have to, and I haven't done it, but if I have to, I'll throw a padded grapple up on the side and, and then pull myself up. But I haven't had to do that. Wow. How much are the ships worth that you usually repossess? Is there a dollar value that you kind of work in between? I would say probably no less than about 10 million. Um, and of course, up to like, for example, that the, the super tanker in Venezuela, that would have been, I don't know how much a super tanker, I don't know how much a 200,000 barrel super tanker would be worth. We're talking many millions of dollars. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Um, I've done other episodes about shipping and some of these oil tankers, I don't know if this includes the cargo. I don't think it does, but they're worth like 80 plus million dollars sometimes which oh, yeah, certainly, is just certainly. absolutely enormous oh, yeah. amounts of money. More. More, yeah. I think this is a, the, the value, this is the insured value. So that's like the insured value of a 30-year-old possibly not working as it, as it once did tanker, and that's still 80 million. So it's, that's probably half of what it was worth when it was manufactured and nice and shiny. Uh, take me through the first... I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes of a ship extraction mission. You, you sneak on the ship. What do you do once you're on there? What's the first thing that has to be done? The first thing is to go to the wheelhouse and ensure that your uh, controls are working and that you, the ship has power, that you can get power to the ship. At the same time I go to the wheelhouse, the chief engineer takes the engine room gang to the engine room, and then the Chief Engineer and I start talking on the ship's internal communication to coordinate starting the engine, it's, especially if there's going to be any sound that would be heard outside of the ship. We have to coordinate that. Um, for example, even starting a generator could be noticed on, on, the, on the shore if the ship was dead ship to begin with. So at the same time, the deck crew are taking their axes uh, forward and aft, and they're getting ready to chop the lines. Um, the moment that the chief engineer has uh, air up and can signal to me that he has enough air pressure to start the main engine, then I will start the I will start the main engine first. You never want to chop the lines until you got the main engine started, because if the main engine doesn't start, you might have a shot at it some other time. But once you've chopped the lines, there's no going back. <laughs> so. The moment that the main engine starts and you get the first few puffs of smoke out of the out of the funnel, then I get on the uh, horn and I tell the the crews fore and aft to chop the lines. Then I've got a quartermaster who's on the wheel, and I tell the quartermaster, I give the quartermaster his steering instructions to move the ship away from the dock, and to steer for the the fastest way to open water. 
Wow. You're chopping the lines with an axe. So do they still use ropes? They don't use chains for this? They, they still use good old-fashioned? Oh, no. Oh, no, no. I'm talking about the dock lines that, that secure the ship to the dock. You, know, you yeah. always use ropes. Two and a half inch diameter ropes. Wow. That's it, huh? I just, I, for some reason, I envision these just absolutely massive steel chains, but I guess you have to move them by hand, so that wouldn't work, right? Well, yeah. you have a bunch of them. You, you probably have eight, eight to ten uh, dock lines. So, yeah, that, that's, that's, and a two and a half inch diameter line has a lot of strength. Yeah, no kidding. I, that Now it all makes sense that they use a, a, an axe. What happens if you get on the ship and the engine won't start? You mentioned that you might have another shot at it. Is that, do you mean, okay, this thing won't start, we need a, a widget, everybody sneak back off this thing, and we're going to go get the widget and come back in three days? Is that what we're talking about? Well, that would be the best thing to do in the case. <laughs> yeah. The worst thing is you have to jump over the side and swim away. <laughs> My God, that sounds awful in a port too. With, because you have gear, right? I mean, you'd have to ditch some of that or stash it somewhere. Jumping off of a boat that big in a port sound in the dark sounds kind of horrifying. Oh, I've been faced with it. <sighs> oh my gosh, in Venezuela or where wherever, not a place I'd want to be in. None of these places are places you want to be in prison. That's for sure. If you need a part, though, how do you get the part? How does that even work? You're in Haiti. Oh, hey, we need a very specialized thing for a diesel boat manufactured in Germany. How do you? How could you get that? Somebody's got to fly it in for you, yeah? Yeah, I'll get a guy in Germany to get on the plane with it and fly it to me. Oh, my gosh. And they just land at a small airport in Port-au-Prince or whatever, near Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and drop off the... The, I don't know. I don't even know any ship parts that aren't <laughs> the giant wheel that they probably don't use anymore. Uh, with some engine part, and you just ins your guy has to install that on the fly, too, no doubt. Well, that, that case in, Venice, in, in Trinidad, the shipyard, which is a pirate shipyard, they had taken off the air start valve off the main engine because they were afraid that somebody might do exactly what I was thinking of doing. <laughs> On my okay. inspection, that's what I was looking for. And when I saw the air start valve missing, which is it's about a foot about a foot by a foot, and it sits on the front of the engine. When I saw it missing, I had my chief engineer uh, from, he was actually in Germany. Peter Schick is, was his name. He's dead now. And I had him go to the manufacturer, get the air start from Werkspur, actually in, in Holland, get it, and then send it to Miami. And then a guy in Miami flew it down to to me and uh in trinidad and then i took it on board when i when i and my my confederate took the ship out wow and and so you really do need an amazing engineer who can sit there and go all right we've got a very limited amount of time you need to put this piece in make sure it works start the engine and oh by the way there's no working lights down there so you're gonna have a headlamp or whatever during the time you're doing this and the every minute that goes by is time that the authorities might catch on to what we're doing or the guard might have a change of heart or the oh this is stressful it's stressful even sort of hearing about thinking about this kind of thing yeah it's stressful tell me more about haiti you the ship you took out of haiti this was not the most calm time to go for well haiti seems like kind of a wild place anyway but this was not the most chill time to be in the country tell 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 me about that well, Haiti was actually in the middle of the revolution at that moment, and um, the uh, Aristide had fled, and uh, all the policemen in Haiti, I, I know Haiti quite well. I have godchildren in Haiti. I, I own property in Haiti, and uh, I spent many a year there. Policemen in Haiti are very, shall we say, attuned to self-preservation. The moment that social order breaks down, they tear off their uniforms and run up in the hills. And so... At that time, all the police stations were deserted. There were no police to be found. In fact, interestingly enough, in Miraguan, which is a little port where, where that ship was being hid, the Port Authority actually hired some men and gave them uniforms because they knew that foreign ships were not going to come into a port with no police. Wow. So the mayor hired some men to be policemen and walk around in uniforms to reassure the foreign crews that everything was okay. And these were just but, Schmo, Joe Schmo wearing a police uniform, not actually police. Wow, fake police. And when we went, landed to go to the ship, and when we went from Port-au-Prince to uh, Miraguan, there's about five or six towns on the way, 
Every police station had been burned out. The police cars were turned over and burned out. Wow. Um, the there was uh, all the roads were full of bandits uh, at the time. Um, and in Haiti, it's very easy to be a road bandit because all you got to do is roll some rocks in the road, and the the terrain is so rugged that there's no chance of going around. You have to stay on the road. So. When the car stops the ropes, starts stops at the rocks, you shoot the occupants and take whatever they have. Oh my God, it's a pretty common. In fact, it's even worse now today than it was then, unfortunately. But when we got to Miraguan and uh, I found out the situation with the ship, the uh, the the owner had a couple of guards are on board. They had been selling fuel off the ship to all comers, so I told them that I. Uh, I had my my Haitian tell them that that I was there to buy that I was going to bring a tugboat to buy fuel, the tugboat that was going to tow it off. Of course, <laughs> they were happy with that. And then I hired a couple of uh, SWAT team guys from Port-au-Prince to come down and control the crowd because I knew there was going to be a big crowd while we were trying to cut the anchor chain. We had to cut the anchor chains with a torch, and it's, I thought it was going to take about fifteen minutes, and it took half an hour. Yeah, which was, and of course, uh, people come fleeing down. Oh, that was the time where there was only one cell phone in the entire town that worked. And there was only one place that it worked. It was up on a soccer pitch on the top of a hill. So that's what that's the time I hired a witch doctor to go and put a, a curse on that soccer field. <laughs> so the court director who had the cell phone wouldn't go up there and, and call Port-au-Prince to report it. And uh, in fact, my client, the mortgagee, love to show his friends a line item in his bill, one hundred dollars for the services of one witch doctor. So, so I you hire a witch doctor and what just made sure that everybody around knew that there was a witch doctor on the soccer field and they were like, I'm not going near that thing. I don't care what you tell me. I'm not going up there with the cell phone. That that place is cursed. That's that's brilliant. That's brilliant. That's the probably the cheapest way. To keep anybody out of any any, I mean, you you didn't have to bribe anybody, you didn't have to threaten anybody. You just had to have some, I don't know, chi dried chicken heads spread around the place or whatever, and that was it. Well, I'd hired that same guy twenty years earlier to come on my ship when I was a ship captain, and put the powder on my ship to keep the thieves off. And the interesting thing about it was, he in twenty years he hadn't aged a bit. Maybe he's onto something. It's all of the, the, the oh. powder, the, whatever's in that powder, those chicken heads, man. So, so is, I guess then witchcraft is something that just everybody sort of universally believes in down there. That's correct. Wow, wow. In two thousand and four, Aristide flees. The president of Haiti flees. I know some French Foreign Legion guys that actually got him out of there, and. If memory serves, didn't they empty all the prisons or somebody emptied all the prisons? They just went to this, the national penitentiary and just opened all the doors, let all the gangsters out. Probably what? To distract the police slash let their friends out? Is that was that the idea behind that? I, it's been so long. Yeah, to let their friends and relatives out. Surely. Mm -hmm. wow. Every, the national penitentiary uh, normally holds about 1,500, 2,000 prisoners and they were all released. And not only, not only that, but all the all the jails all throughout the country were all opened. I can't imagine. You you said you lived in Haiti. What is that even like? I, it's just got to be so incredibly wild. Normally, it's not. Normally, it's very peaceful, and the Haitians are wonderful, peaceful, happy, joyous people. <sighs> the 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 history of Haiti is a complicated one, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and the responsibilities for for the Haitian situation are can, must be borne by more than just the Haitians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. I mean, it's got a colonial and slavery background and up, uh, slavery uprising, corruption. I mean, it's just it's it's like I mean, it's just quite tragic is the understatement of the of the show here that it's so tragic. But you living there, what brought you there? You're just curious and adventurous or did you meet somebody that you've that you love down there. I mean, how what what brings you to a place like that? And you say, I want to live here. I want to buy a house here. No, no, I was a ship captain, <clears throat> and my my owner got a two year contract to carry rice from Freeport, Texas, to Haiti, to Miraguan, that same little town. And that's my first time in Miraguan was when my ship arrived. Uh, I think eighty four. That would have been. Uh, and then, of course, I just met people and uh, and became friends and. And then later I had a shipbreaking operation in Miraguan and hired, I had a hundred Haitians working for me. 
Yeah, is, property. is ship breaking what it sounds like? Is that just a sal salvaging old boats? Is that what that means? Yeah, that's right. Breaking, okay. cutting up ships. Mm -hmm. I've seen those videos where they blare the horn and they ran, run the thing up on the beach as fast as they can. And then uh, all these, I guess it's in, maybe it's in Bangladesh and all these guys are running around and I, it was it was mystifying until somebody told me that that's how they get the boat on shore and then take it apart. Yeah, we didn't have to do that. We have deep water at my property where we can just come alongside, uh, side by side, and then cut the ship up alongside. But that's how they do it where you ha where you don't have a dock where you have to run the ship up onto the beach. So during the earthquake and all these other tragedies, are you, I mean, you're worried about your people, I assume, but you're also worried about your business down there, right? Do you have people protecting it while you're not there? No, no, my property is unimproved. Uh, there was no worry about that. It's just, my property is just some bare coral ground next to the port of Miraguan. I see. Okay. Wow. Wow. Uh, you've got a lot of tricks up your sleeve, man. I, I heard you once told a guard or had someone tell a guard his mother had a heart attack and he just runs off the boat, which I think is also quite genius. Um, what jobs have you turned down? Uh, the, the submarine job sounds like it didn't work out. What other jobs have you said, no, thank you, this sounds way too dangerous? You know, I, <clears throat> the jobs I've turned down were not so much because they were well. There was that one that that ferry in Venezuela that that we didn't turn the job down. It just advised we advised the client that it was uh, it was impractical. It would be too dangerous. What which what was which one was, was this? That was the ferry where I was afraid that they would chase it with helicopters. Ah, that was the ferry. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, and out of a small port called Puerto La Cruz, and which is many many miles to get to international water but even even then even once we got to international water there was no guarantee that they wouldn't chase us um well i think there was one ship uh there was a ship in there was another ship in punta fijo venezuela where the where the claim where it was a claim of damaged cargo and I, when i got to punta fijo I found that the cargo actually had been damaged. In fact, the cargo was still at the port, and uh, it was a cargo of, of uh, paper. Pa um, what do you call that? Um, um, like recycled paper? Not recycled. It was a uh, white paper that had been made from trees. It was a pulp. I'm sorry, the word is pulp. pulp. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> and the and the pulp had gotten wet and uh, on the ship, and was damaged. And so we turned that job down because it was a legitimate claim. Other I than see. that, I, I don't remember exactly how many. We don't. Have, we haven't turned that many down. I'm. I'm happy to say. Tell me about the Vladivostok incident. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Uh, that was when my the lady I went with got into a fist fight with her translator in front of the, <laughs> in front of the office of the guy we were there to buy ships from, and as soon as he and uh, he grabbed her by the throat. And was shaking her. He was throttling her by the throat. And the moment that the this tall, dignified Russian guy opened the door, she kicked him between the legs. He howled like a monkey. <laughs> then they saw the they saw the Russian, and they both straightened up, assumed dignified expressions, and the three of us marched into his office with him going, "What?" <laughs> She, he was from Bulgaria. She called him. She she got in the habit of calling him the, the the translator. He turned out to be our enemy. He turned us over to the Russian mafia to to be captured. She called him the Bulgarian. Wow. Wait a minute. So okay. So you went there to buy ships, right? Or from this guy. And how did it go so wrong? And I don't just mean the getting kicked in the nuts into the fist fight. I mean that's. The, I definitely want to hear a little bit more about that. But how does it? De how does an operation degrade to that level? Well, what we didn't know and what we found out was that uh, Vladivostok had been taken over by the Russian mafia. And in fact, uh, the week before we got there, the assistant port director had been shot dead, uh, apparently because he refused to go along with it. Um, what happened was uh, the mafia found out that we were there to buy scrap ships. I was there to buy them for a Chinese buyer, who, and we were going to take them from Vladivostok to China for scrapping. They were, these were these were scrap fishing vessels, uh, fish processors, large three thousand ton 
dead weight fish processing vessels, a whole bunch of them. But when the mafia found out that we were there to buy, their plan was to capture me and have me call Dr. Yin, that was my client, and tell him to come to Vladivostok with a bunch of cash. And then if I didn't, of course, you know, they would beat me or whatever they had to do to force me to, to call him and tell him to come. So I, I knew they were looking for me. In fact, they had when we got back to the hotel, the receptionist, who was a quite friendly lady, told us that they that these guys, she she called them musicians. That's the Russian word for for mafia. That they that they had been there looking for us, but she put us on a floor uh, that was not open to foreigners, so they couldn't find us. And then we sneaked out of town the next morning. Wow, it was pretty lucky that she did that for you because did do you think she put herself a little bit at risk helping you? I mean, she has to live there. Mm, I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think they would. I don't know, because when we left, nothing had happened. So I, I don't know. But she, she was very helpful. And she was very, well, see, <laughs> this guy had stolen our, our visas. So we were stuck. <clears throat> he st and we knew that he had stolen our visas because when he left with this mafia guy, he held up our two visas, their little yellow cards, and gave me a big grin and waved with his fingers at me to show that he had stolen our visas. So we had a real hassle that evening uh, getting uh, replacement visas. Oh, so my gosh. Morning. And he obviously the interpreter just, do you think he planned that all along? Or do you think he just smelled the money and decided to call his friend's cousin? He got into, he got buddies with the, with the mafia guy. Andre was the mafia guy. He and Andre got to be buddies. And I could tell they were getting to be buddies. How, how did, what year was this? 90, this was about two weeks after Vladivostok was open to foreigners. Before that, foreigners were not allowed in the, in, in the city. Oh, so really? This was about two weeks after Vladivostok was open to foreigners. This oh, wow. 93 or so. Why was it closed to foreigners? Because there's a port there? Or was there a submarine base there or something like that, a naval base? A large naval base. Mm -hmm. Russia's only naval base on the Pacific. I had a job that I didn't take in Vladivostok, and it would have been in 2003. And it sounds like it would have been really interesting, but possibly I made the right choice, I think. Take your food with you. Take your food with you? Really? No, no good food there? I mean, they got to have, maybe it's a little better now. No? I hope it's better now. It was horrible then. Yeah, man. Stuff like that is just so fascinating. Places like that are super interesting. Obviously, getting kidnapped by the Russian mafia is less interesting. Uh, or maybe it's very interesting, but for all the wrong reasons. So you never got those ships for your buyer, your Chinese buyer, I assume. Nope, nope. That deal completely fell through. Would you go back to Russia? Are you? I mean, those guys surely have forgotten you by now. Oh, yeah. I have no problems going back to Russia. Wow. I'm sure you do this mostly to make a living, but is there any part of you that gets a kick out of recovering a ship from thieves who stole it in the first place? Yeah, yeah, I like the fact that uh, that the bad guys get their comeuppance. It uh, gives me a great deal of satisfaction. I loved it when uh, the the guy who tried to steal uh, the Maya Express showed up at the, we took it to the Bahamas, which is a very friendly jurisdiction for mortgagees. And the thief showed up in the Bahamas to claim that we had stolen his ship and to try to get it back. The judge told him, and this is in the record, <clears throat> that you're lucky I don't have you put in jail right here, right now. And uh, so I, we, we were, I was happy about that. And my client was quite happy. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's kind of a relief, I suppose, that there's still, hearing things like this and you doing the job that you do, when you get back to the United States, you must just be thinking, I'm glad I live in, in this very imperfect place that has rule of law, where I have recourse other than bribing a judge. Uh, I can make money honestly, rather than stealing from other people. There's gotta, it really puts things into stark contrast. Yeah, uh, I, many times I have, when my friends and neighbors and my wife, when I was married, when they would complain about the the dryer not working or <clears throat> complain about the, the dishwasher being on the fritz, I would have to hold my tongue. Yeah, I, especially after living in in a place like Haiti and saying the dryer's on the fritz, though the Wi-Fi is too slow. Is that the problem today? Yeah, it's uh, very, again, stark contrast. You're 
a very interesting guy. You've been a lawyer. You still are a lawyer. Uh, what else? Pilot, crop duster, private investigator. Uh, I don't know the technical term for this. Dead body transporter. I assume there's a better way to phrase that. <laughs> yeah, I flew for a mortuary service. I yeah. flew, flew bodies around. Uh, a stunt man. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm guessing you don't do that anymore. I haven't been called on to do it in a long time, but my my stunt boss and I are still good buddies, and uh, and in fact, we might be going out to uh, to uh, Arizona uh, sometime in the fall for a for a, a movie. Wow! Uh, and uh, the and thing she, about it is, yeah? the thing about it is, is that it's very hard for a, a a a young man cannot double for an old man. So if you have an actor who is an old man. His stunt double has to be an old man, or the or the the audience can actually see the difference. So there is actually there is actually work for physically capable old stunt doubles. I heard that in the latest Indiana Jones, he they wanted to get him a stunt double, and he and Harrison Ford said, "Man, I'm old. I want people to see me hunched over while I'm riding a horse because I'm 75 or however old he is." And that that's admirable, but also he's lucky he didn't get thrown off that horse, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what What do you want to do when you retire? You were an English teacher. You might go back to that. No, I don't think so. No, uh, no. I think. Uh, what is it? To, let me guess. It's too dangerous. Ah, uh, it's too frustrating, and it's too uh, too r r rule bound. Mm -hmm. I suppose it would be possible if I had a a a classroom without rules where I could conduct, where I didn't have to turn in lesson plans. That was one thing I never did was turn in lesson plans. It's against my, it's against my religion. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot. Luckily, principals, after, after a few weeks, principals realize there's no hope and they give up asking for them. But I doubt if I'll go back to teaching. I don't know. I'm playing drums in a, in a blues band now. I might keep doing that. This sounds like something that should be made into a movie. Is that, I know that was an idea early on. Is that still happening? After 15 years, 14 years, something like that, I, yeah, yeah, there are people who are still working on it. I, I don't, Michael Bono stays on top of that. I myself don't follow it. Michael's your business partner in the uh, ship repo business. I see. Well, never a dull day in the office. Hey, Max? Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe in the office it's a dull day, but I don't get to stay in the office much. Thank you very much, Captain Hardberger. I really appreciate it. This is a long time in the making, crazy interesting. And yeah, I, I hope you stay safe and we'll, we'll see you either in a movie or a, an English classroom sometime in the future. Yeah, and let's hope not in the news. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. All right, thank you guys. Thanks for checking out this entire episode of The Jordan Harbinger Show. If you're interested in exploring this topic further, check out the Jordan Harbinger Show podcast feed. There, we dive even deeper on this and many other topics. In the audio podcast, I also close open loops, cover things discussed off camera, off air, and give some parting lessons from our guest. You can find the Jordan Harbinger Show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, any podcast app, or at jordanharbinger.com. And also, if you found this episode useful, please share it with those you care about. Last but not least, like, comment, and subscribe.